is there anything that makes humans irreplaceable? So are, are we getting into a stage where there's nothing that AI, that humans can do that AI won't be able to do? Uh, from a functional standpoint, from a, a, a an objective standpoint, I don't think so. Um, and that actually begs a very deep philosophical and spiritual question, which is what is the point of living? What is the point of being a human? Um, and that uh, is something that I've done some work on. I, I wrote a paper or a, a short book called Post Nihilism, um, where what I suspect is that we are barreling towards uh, what I call a nihilistic crisis, or actually we're in the middle of a nihilistic crisis. And it actually started with the Industrial Revolution. Um, if you look at uh, a lot of poetry and literature, uh, works of fiction during the, the rise of the Industrial Revolution, a lot of people had a lot of existential anxiety about what was the point of being human in an era of machines. And this kind of pops up every now and then, right? Same thing happened with computers, um, with the advent of you know uh, uh, high-speed computers, nuclear weapons, so on and so forth. Uh, technological advance advancements tend to give us some existential anxiety. But to your question about like, okay, what is the benefit of being a human in a world where from a product productivity standpoint or an economic standpoint, machines can do everything that we can do better, faster, and cheaper, what's the point? And so that is where we have to change our orientation towards how we value our own life and our own subjective experience. So that's a deeply, deeply philosophical and religious perspective or a question. And it's, it's really interesting because depending on someone's spiritual upbringing or spiritual disposition, the question lands very differently because many uh, religious doctrines around the world basically say that humans have a soul and that sets us apart. And so whether or not that's true, uh, people have a model for just saying my subjective experience of being is, uh, is very meaningful and it is unique. And so part of overcoming a nihilistic crisis is we all have to face that whether or not we believe in souls or God or whatever. And we have to kind of go back to basics and look at the subjective experience of our own being. And so back to your question earlier about children, I suspect that children who grow up with AI, they will just intrinsically know, oh yeah, my experience is different from this machine and that's okay. And that they won't have any existential anxiety about it. I hope at least. <laughs> do you have, a, are you hopeful for the future or do you have this anxiety? Um, no, I, I am, uh, I think I'm biologically programmed to be optimistic. I just, I can't be cynical. Um, and I, I, uh, part of that is that I've done a tremendous amount of work to understand what the dangers and risks are. And I've also tried to contribute to coming up with a, a more optimistic outcome, the machines. So we, we all learn this from watching Scooby-Doo. Um, the monsters are always humans right? There's no such thing as, as an evil monster out there. The problem is always humans. And so this is, this is a big reason that I've done my work is because, you know, it's not, it's not that a machine is going to replace you and that's a bad thing, right? We all fantasize about like, Hey, I want to, you know, go live in the countryside and just go fishing every day. We all know what we want to do if we don't have to work. What we are truly afraid of is not being able to take care of ourselves. Is that if the machine takes our job, we're going to go hungry. We're going to lose our home. We're going to end up lonely and and whatever. That's the actual fear. Um, nobody actually wants to keep working, right? Nobody want like I remember one of the advertisements for um for like uh, health insurance here in America was you get to keep your health insurance. You like your health. Nobody likes health insurance. It's a necessary evil, <laughs> right? Jobs, occupations are a necessary evil of the economic environment that, the, that we're in and the technological limitations that we're in. And so as these things progress, this is, this is, I'm basically just unpacking why I'm optimistic. As these things progress, I hope that we're all going to be able to have kind of a back to basics moment where it's like you wake up one day and it's like, how do you actually want to live? Right. If you want to go fishing every day, do it. If you want to focus on being an opera singer, go do that. You know, there's, we all have stuff that we want to do, but that we sacrifice for the sake of earning enough money to take care of ourselves. And that is the reality for most of us today. I suppose one of the reasons why we have this worry is because currently we live in sort of a negotiated environment, right? The success of labor movements was because labor was needed. When humans are no longer needed, it, 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 there's sort of a worry that we're not gonna have the opportunity to go fishing, Right, we're, we're going to have nothing, and I guess that's that's the the worry that you're pointing out. What 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 do you think the f the first jobs are that are going to go? 
Well, there's already been quite a few layoffs. Um, various uh, uh, communities on Reddit or private communities on Discord. Um, so for instance, my uh, fiance's, uh, we're both writers, but she's on a few uh, private writing communities. Um, copywriters have already been laid off and replaced by AI. Um, uh, marketing teams have been notified that, you know, they've got a year until they're all going to get laid off and replaced by, you know, AI generated images and AI gem generated emails. Um, so it's happening. Um, yeah, uh, uh, that's, <laughs> that, that, that's where we're at now, I guess to, to your, your larger point of, you know, if we're all replaceable, you know, what's, what's the bottom line. And the fact of the matter is from a corporate perspective, from a, from the perspective of neoliberalism, human labor is one of the most expensive aspects of productivity. And it's also the biggest constraint. You look at a uh, population decline in places like China and Japan, because China just crested, right? So from here on out, China's population is going down for at least the next century. Japan has been in decline for a couple decades now, uh, ditto for Italy and a few other nations. So their labor force is contracting, right? And from an economic perspective, that's really bad for, for, for nations. So AI hopefully will actually shore up those labor, uh, labor markets and actually replace lost human labor. Now, because humans are so expensive, right? You can pay uh, $20 a month for chat GPT and it can basically serve as an executive assistant and personal coach and every, it can replace literally thousands of dollars worth of labor and it costs $20 a month. Chat GPT is infinitely cheaper than most human employees. Um, and that's only going to get better, right? Because either the model is going to get more efficient and cheaper, um, or it's going to get smarter and more powerful and therefore more valuable or both in all likelihood. So one, one of the things that I predict is that we are going to have a post-labor uh, market economy before too long. And in that respect, uh, basically economic productivity will be decoupled from human labor. Um, and in that case, you know, you're going to see quadrillion dollar valuation uh, for companies that have no employees. And that might sound like that, that could be an ingredient for a dystopian world that nobody wants to live in. We'll get to like the regulation and stuff of that later. But from a, from a, from a purely GDP perspective, AI is going to be the best thing that ever happened to GDP, to, uh, to uh, economics, because again, it will decouple uh, human labor from the constraint and that there, there will still be a few constraints, natural resources, rare minerals, uh, fresh water, arable land, right? There's going to be, uh, there's always going to be some physical constraints, but we're going to remove human labor as one of the main, uh, constraints to economics. And that is going to mandate kind of those things, like you said, like if you want to go fishing, well, how, right? If you don't have any economic power, if you don't have any way to make a demand, then that's a big problem which is what we're going to have to negotiate. We're going to have to negotiate a new social contract, basically. What do you think the impact is going to be on births ultimately? Do you think people are going to just start having AI children because it's cheaper? You know, that's a really difficult question. I could see it going either way. Um, there's plenty of books and, and, and fiction out there and research papers. Um, people have predicted, you know, the population uh, explosion, you know, the earth will become uninhabitable because we'll have billions and billions of people that we can't feed. Other people are worried that, you know, the population is going to collapse. Um, and I actually had a, a pretty long conversation about this just to kind of clarify my own ideas uh, again with chat GPT. Um, and so there's a few driving factors that cause uh, birth rates to decline. Um, uh, women entering the workforce, uh, education and empowerment for women, uh, access to birth control. So it turns out when a society advances and becomes a little bit more uh, sophisticated or, or gains more access or, or some, you know, Gini coefficient goes up, whatever metrics you use, education goes up, fertility rates go down. Some of that has to do with the choices of family planning. You know, men and women decide to have fewer children. Women have more control over their own fate. Um, and so fertility rates tend to go down. And this is a very, very reliable trend globally. Um, you know, it, it, regardless of culture, regardless of other economic conditions, as education rates go up, as uh, 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 women in the workforce goes up, fertility rates goes down. This is a global thing with no exceptions, right? So if you extrapolate that out, then you can probably make a, a relatively safe assumption that as AI spreads around the world and economics and education and everything goes up, that fertility rates will continue to go down 
uh, around the whole world. Um, South Korea, I believe, has the lowest fertility rate on the planet at 0.8 births uh, per woman, which is uh, like um, just uh, just above a third of the replacement rate. So it's entirely possible that under these uh, trends that uh, population collapse is actually the most real danger that we face. Mm -hmm. So, well, what do you do about that? One thing that I think is going to happen is that AI will lead to uh, medical breakthroughs. And I suspect that we are close, if not already at uh, the, the place of what's called longevity escape velocity, which is that the medical breakthroughs that happen every year extend your life by more than a year. Mm -hmm. So basically, hypothetically, if you are healthy enough today, if you're not about to die and you have access to decent enough uh, health care, then that the compounding returns of medical research and AI means that you and I could live to be several centuries old which means that the population of the planet will stabilize as uh, birth rates continue to decline. Now, whether I, th I do think that some people will ch ultimately choose like AI companions uh, as they become more realistic. Certainly a lot of people have seen shows like Westworld. Um, you know, one of my favorite characters of all time is data from Star Trek. And I would love to have data as a friend. Right. <laughs> um, so I absolutely suspect that, um, that uh, anthropomorphic uh, machines will be part of our lives before too long. Um, whether what form they take, you know, whether it's a robotic dog that never dies um, or, you know, a walking, talking friend that is always there to hang out um, or if it's a romantic partner like, uh, you know, in the movie Her um, with Joaquin Phoenix and uh, Scarlett Johansson. There's lots of possibilities uh, for how life is going to be. But like I said, I think one of the most reliable, durable trends is fertility rates go down. So the question is, will that be offset by longevity? So in other words, rather than sort of the the dangerous skynet that some people envision we might just get uh out competed sexually uh into extinction something along those lines yeah that's that's entirely possible especially when you consider that um actually there was a line from terminator 2. it was when sarah connor was watching uh you know the terminator arnold schwarzenegger play with john and she realized that the machine has infinite patience and will always be there because john was his mission and I realized that from a philosophical standpoint, one reading of that is that the machine could be a better parent than a human parent could ever be. Because for a child, from a child's perspective, they should be their prime, their parents' primary mission. But that's never the case, right? Parents are humans too, and they have their own needs, their own desires, their own plans. But when you have a machine that it's, if it is designed that you are its primary mission, whether you're an adult or a child, like that could be like, from some perspectives, a better outcome. Um, obviously, some people are probably cringing, which is understandable. That's a perfectly healthy reaction to the <laughs> idea of replacing children and parents with machines, but it's possible, right? Hypothetically possible. <laughs>